one abutment to rule them all. So in the industry, there is a, a movement to create a uniform platform, one platform that allows you to have one abutment size to rule all of your implants. And I, I, I got to tell you guys, this makes a lot of sense if you're lazy, okay? So if you're lazy, you got to love this because you, you, what do I mean by lazy? I mean, you don't have to ask for uh, a certain size abutment, do you? You just say to your, to your helper, your assistant, you say, get me the abutment, right? It just makes your life really easy. And, and I get that. Everybody gets that. Where I have problems with this concept is this. The implant that's a three millimeter implant takes a small abutment because it's a small implant, right? The implant that is a big implant, like a six millimeter diameter implant, takes the same small abutment. All right, so are, are you tracking already with me? Because here's how this works. Where do we place small implants? Well, we place them in centrals, or not centrals, but laterals and incisors on the lower, right? So small, smallest teeth in the mouth. So a small implant on a small tooth makes a lot of sense. So for that, it makes sense. Now, where do you place a six millimeter diameter implant? You place it in a first molar. Where are the highest bite forces in the mouth? In the first molar. So now you've got this beautiful, thick, deep, you know, really wide implant, lots of bone to implant contact area, lots of titanium. So the likelihood of that implant having a mechanical complication is darn near zero except for you just put a nice skinny neck on top of that because you gave it the same abutment that was on the 3.0. And that doesn't make any sense to me, guys. So in my practice, however much I want to be lazy, however much I want to take advantage of the concept of one abutment to rule them all, right? I'm not going to do it, not because of me. I'm going to do it because it's in the best interest of my patient. And what do I mean by that? That three millimeter diameter abutment placed on a six millimeter implant will get the patient out the door. It'll even maybe get them down the road a couple of years and then it breaks. Now here's the, here's the catch. Most dentists are not engineered trained. They're biologically trained. And when something breaks in the patient's mouth, two to three to four years after we do it, we don't own it as an industry. Dentists don't own that failure. What they typically say is they turn to Mrs. Smith and they say, Mrs. Smith, what did you have for dinner last night? As if the reason the crown broke was what they chewed on the night before. And that's not it, guys. The reason these things make it a little while and then break is because of fatigue failure. And fatigue failure is when you bend something back and forth enough times, like a coat hanger. If you bend it back and forth enough times, it gets hot and then it breaks. Well, if you have an abutment that's being bent over time, which happens when, you're, when you have a, a, a malpositioned implant, so you have a Snoopy or an ET with a thin neck that's being bent over time, it breaks and it normally doesn't break right away. The beautiful thing about this for, for those who have been trained in biology is they don't know any different. They, they, these failures are so far from the placement of the implant. So you place the implant and something fails three years later, you don't think you're the problem. As a clinician, we don't think we caused that problem. And this goes back to many of the videos that you've seen on the channel where we emphasize the single most important thing you can do as an implantologist is get your implant in the right location because your failures typically aren't going to be immediate. You're not going to see them immediate. And it's a really a kind of a bit of a travesty in the industry because when things fail right away, for instance, if we, if we deliver a solution and it fails that night, the next day, we pretty much own it, don't we? As an industry, we go, oh, well, I must have gotten some saliva in there and I didn't get a good bond and that's why the crown came off last night. So we can all get behind that. But when you put time in between the failure, regardless of the failure mode, but when you put time between there, you're building in plausible deniability. And therefore, we don't own it. So people say, well, I've been doing okay dentistry. I've been doing okay implant dentistry for 30 years, and I've been okay. Well, yeah, 
but the failures you're having that you had over those 30 years that you that's that you saw not the ones that moved and they moved out of your practice they went somewhere else they had a failure even the patients aren't thinking this failed at three years after placement they're not even thinking about coming back to you because even they know that doesn't seem right right but in actuality, if you look at it from a different perspective, through a different lens, if you look at it from an engineering's perspective, you can clearly see that if it wasn't placed in the right location or the solution is a very, very tiny neck on a, on a first molar, which requires so much force, you can have significant mechanical complications. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley. If you found this information useful, please give us a like, subscribe, and share with your friends.